Well, hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Tina Olson. I'm the executive director of Many in the Sacred Hoof. And my program works to address violence in tribal communities across the country, from a small village in Alaska to a Pueblo in the Southwest to the Plains all the way to the East Coast. I'm honored to be here tonight to begin this conversation and dialogue about suicide. Now, although most of our work that we do, that my organization does and our staff does across the country is to respond to the epidemic proportions of violence against Indian women, we always come into the reality and experiences of their children. You can't address the issues of poverty, violence, sexual assault, without it encompassing their family. And although I know that tonight is about suicide across races and cultures, I just wanted to give you a little insight to tribal communities. Our youth suffered three times the national average of suicides. And in some reservations, it's 10 times that. Half of our people, our youth, will die before the age of 24. These aren't statistics I've made up. This is research that's been done to survey the quality of our lives. 2.3% of our youth are exposed to trauma than the national average. When you close your eyes and you think of these things, then you can understand the epidemic, not just crisis, but epidemic proportions of violence, both on and off the reservation of our youth. I want to introduce, I'm trying to calm myself down because even though no child of mine has committed suicide, we've been touched by it. My daughter graduated school 10 years ago, and she was one of three Indian kids at Denfield High. And they stuck together all through high school supported each other, were friends and buddies to each other. When they graduated from high school, one of the parents, Carol, said, Tina, we're so proud of our kids, let's give them a party. So together we gave them an open house. Lots of their friends came and lots of relatives came. And it was wonderful. And then about three weeks later, one of these boys, of the three who had graduated, hung himself in the garage. We couldn't figure it out. This was 10 years ago. My daughter for two years struggled with why I couldn't see it. What could I have done to prevent it? He got through all of high school, all the crap that kids go through. And he survived and he graduated. Yet something so deep inside of him, some pains that she couldn't see, something layered deep inside drove him to commit suicide. So even though it hasn't happened in my family, I considered this child one of my family. That's why it's so important tonight to participate, to experience this event, so that maybe it'll have a rippling effect, like a stone when you throw into water, going out into your community, going into your own homes, your jobs, your neighbors. Tonight, what's left being part of this traveling exhibit. Your presenters are going to be John Bauer. I hope I'm saying the name right. Curator of What's Left Exhibit. Dr. Arnie Vinio, and I hope I said that right, Ivy. <laughs> I only asked about 10 times. I didn't want to mess that up. Uh, Dr. Arnie Vinio, local physician, writer, and lecturer and music performed by Jake Vineal, who's a poet and a songwriter. Thank you and welcome. All right, so I've, I've reached the stage of my life. I have to take my glasses off to read my notes or leave them on so I can see you, so I can't really see you that well. But really, thanks for having me. This is like an absolute honor to be here, and I and thank you for coming out. I want to 
thank a couple of foundations. I want to thank the Northland Foundation and I want to thank the Miller Dwan Foundation for their support. And Joan Oswald is here representing the Miller Dwan Foundation. They stepped up to the plate and gave money to this project when it was in its infancy stages. I want to thank the artists and I want to thank you for coming because it's really, really important that you are here. Um, in 2013, I lost my daughter, yeah, 2000, March 2013, I lost my daughter Megan to suicide. She was 34 years old. She was beautiful. She was smart. She was caring. She had an unbelievable heart. She had a smile that could, you know, launch a room. But she struggled with a mental illness. And mental illness has, doesn't take any, you know, it, it doesn't back away. It doesn't make a difference what social class you are, how good you look, how much money you make and she succumbed to a mental illness and she took her life. She drove from um, Grand Marais to Bayfield, Wisconsin, parked her car and took hundreds of Benadryl and died. And it was a traumatic thing. Um, took a lot of grieving, something that a parent doesn't want to experience. But I want to share with you some statistics too because I, I know the statistics and I just don't know how much people know about what's going on here. But in, 19, in 2013, when she died, there were 41,149 suicides in the United States. That is 113 a day, and that 22 of them are military. And in Minnesota, in 2013, there were 683 suicides. Now, I kind of consider these murders. These are murders that nobody talks about. They just don't, because we have this terrible stigma attached to it. You may, unless you're a close family member, you hear about it. Or if you're in a small, tiny little town, you hear about it, but it's more the gossipy type talk, and people don't truly, truly discuss it. So I don't know how that's possible. I don't know why we don't do that. I mean, when one in four people struggle from a mental illness, why the heck aren't we talking about this? Why are we afraid to do this? I have a good friend who has a son that's schizophrenic, and he said to me once, and I never forgot this, he said, when you have cancer, they bring casseroles to your house. When you have a mental illness, they drive by your driveway as fast as humanly possible. And that's the type of stuff that we have to, we have to change. It's shameful, people feel shameful, people pe feel embarrassed. In my case, it was ignorance. I mean, it was just ignorance. I mean, I knew my daughter had a mental illness. I knew she was on medication. I felt the medication would work. Things would be fine, but that's just plain old ignorance on my, on my part. It's, we all need to know what it is. We need to better understand how bad mental illness is and depression is. And I did not know that because your children did not tell you exactly how they feel. And they, and they should, but they don't. So it needs to change. And I just tried to do something different. I wanted to do something different. I wanted to not lecture. I mean, I do give lectures because I think lectures can be compelling. But I wanted to do something different and I wanted to use art as a medium to get this message across, to convey this message. Because I, I personally feel you don't have a heartbeat if you don't like art. And art touches everybody. And you can go around this room and you can read these things, you can look at them, you can touch them, and each of us interprets it differently. And that's what's beautiful about art. And it, is, it has been working. And one of the things I found myself doing when Megan died, after Megan died, is I started looking at obituaries. I don't know why. I just started looking at obituaries. And I'm sure all of you have seen died unexpectedly and died suddenly. And you know, 99% of those are suicides. And when Megan died, we did an obituary. We didn't say that. And it's because I didn't know. I didn't know what we need to do. A huge accomplishment in that area would be to say that Megan died after a long, courageous battle with mental illness. You see it in there where people die after a long, courageous battle with cancer. There's no difference. Absolutely no difference. When the problem is, if I come in here and I have a broken arm or I have a big black eye, you can sympathize with me. You can know something happened to me. But if I got a mental illness and I'm standing up here in front of you, you have no clues. And we need to do, we need to get better at that. Um, so I called these artists. The very first artist I called, I wish he was here, but maybe the roads are not good enough for him to make it from Two Harbors. But there's a piece of glass back, well, where, it's right here. This piece of glass right there, that's Michael Tonder. And he does this amazing glass. And he's the very, very first artist I called. 
and I did not do a call for artists. I wanted to select them myself. So I called him one, like literally 20 seconds into the conversation he said he was in because he lost his son to suicide. <laughs> and that glass is made, that's, a, that's the windows from his son's room, I believe. When, you know, that's the room his son lived in. So they do this amazing work with glass. So then I just started calling artists and it just morphed. It was unbelievable. I want, we wanted to have 20. And then other people said, well, you gotta get this person, you gotta get this person. So we ended up with like 55 pieces of art. And it's, it's been truly amazing. And another thing that we did in my community, we needed to raise money. So we went to these foundations, but we also did a Kickstarter campaign. Does everybody know what a Kickstarter campaign is? Kind of hands. We raised $50,000 in Grand Rapids, Minnesota for this exhibit. People really do care. And there's an interesting twist, because you can't, if you're over 15 years of age, even younger than that, you, you, you can't find anybody that doesn't know somebody that has a mental illness or has, has tried to take their lives or has lost their lives. There's a famous, a, I'm a real picky, in this Kickstarter campaign, you need music to accompany your piece. And it's like a one minute piece. And I work at a public radio station, we have 70,000 CDs, I could not find the right piece of music. So I was watching a golf tournament and, a, and there was a Rolex commercial, and there was this unbelievable piece of music, instrumental, that I just fell in love with. And it's by a guy, it, the, the name of the song is called Smiling, and the guy's name is Harry Gregson Williams. And if you look at him, he's won many Oscars for screenplays, for music, you know, screenplays for, or music for performances, for movies. So I called their company, and I said, I really want to find this guy because this is what I want to do. And they said, well, here's what you can do. You can send him an email and you can expect a response in probably six months to a year. When I got home that night, he had emailed me. His brother just took his life like a week before that. And I tell you, these things, hap these things happen all the way along the line. It's just so common nowadays that it's, it's, just, not, it's, just, <laughs> it's just not right. So when I got home, I, the, the Grand Rapids paper did a story on my daughter because I, and I, I, I wanted it to happen because I was a part of the Blandon Leadership Program and they knew what I was doing and they wanted to encourage it. But people do not step forward and talk about this. So we took out an art, they, they did a story, they won a big award for the story. It was a picture of my daughter holding her basset hound on the front page. If those aren't two things that get your heart, I don't know what does, a basset hound especially. So I left my phone number and my email address on this story. And by the next day, I had 50 people, over 50 people, talk to me or email me and tell me their stories, long dissertations, short ones, about you know trying to take their lives or losing someone. And I find it just amazing that just that little tiny story brought all these people out. And I work for a public radio station. I work for KEXC. We're a community radio station in Grand Rapids, so I have access to interviewing. So I asked all these people to come forward. So I probably did 120 hours of interviews with people who are survivors like myself, moms, dads, brothers, sisters, grandmas, friends, girlfriends. And then I also interviewed a lot of people that tried to take their lives. And I learned so much, you can't believe it and specifically a young girl that has become a very good friend of mine who when she was 16 years old, 16 and a half, she was a quote, perfectly normal girl. Boyfriends, screwing around at school, having fun, and one day like, just literally like that light switch went off, she felt terrible, started to feel bad. She just, something was wrong. She talked to her mom about it. Mom again didn't know much about it. And she, all of a sudden she felt suicidal. She wanted, to, she wanted to have sex, she wanted to drink, she wanted to do all these things that she's never done. Long story short, she, she was depressed. She was at definitely you know, diagnosed with bipolar. She, one day before she went to school, she told her mom she was gonna stay home. She stayed home, got up, took a shower, had breakfast, went on the computer, and went on some search engines to try to figure out, to ask how to kill herself. And some guy in a live chat told her that she needs to kill herself in a car. So she got in her car and she found the perfect spot, sharp corner, a lot of trees, and she uh, drove by it six or seven times and couldn't do it. And then she realized, I can't do this because it's on the, my parents' route to work. So I can't have my parents going to work every day and seeing them where I took my life. So she found another place. And long story short, 
after five attempts she did it and she was airlifted and she struggled and her legs are beat up but she is doing doing very very well my point is we need to get this stuff in schools and I'm not talking 10 minutes in a health class I'm talking some sort of a curriculum where we can address this more thoroughly because why we talk about sex we talk about drugs we talk about drinking we have dare programs come in and tell kids you know the the pitfalls of drinking and you know they're gonna drink it some of them are gonna drink it at some stage in their life why don't we not teach young people what depression is what a mental illness is so that if they are unfortunate enough to have that come upon them like it did in this young girl's case she knows what it is because if you could hear her you can actually listen in that phone booth I'll tell you more about that phone booth but if you could hear her describe how she is a freak you would it would bring you to tears because that's what she felt like she's a normal young girl all of a sudden she's a freak she doesn't know what's wrong with her she doesn't want to talk to people she hides out in her bedroom turns the lights off it's unbelievable so why don't we teach somebody maybe at the eighth grade level what depression is and ongoing so that if it does hit them they know that they're not alone and they know that there's help and they know that they don't have to be fearful of talking to other people about it because other people will know that's why we have to talk about this stuff now, I got shirts here I feel like a I feel like a musician trying to promote my shirts but we have these shirts here they say talk and listen that's all they say they're in the back and that's if you can buy one for 20 bucks it helps our it helps our cause to bring this to other communities but that's what we need to do we need to talk and listen and if any of you are struggling you need to talk to somebody all right you need to talk to somebody and if you know somebody that's struggling you need to talk to them and you need to be abrupt and ask them are you contemplating suicide because the biggest mistake you can make is not doing anything at all and you need to remember that that's the biggest mistake. some people are like worried about what they're gonna say not saying anything is the bad thing all right so I want you to go in this exhibit this is hundred and twenty hours of interviewing condensed into six minutes and it's testimonials from people and it takes six minutes so if you can't do it today I ask that you listen to it sometime people are afraid to go in there but there's hope in that phone booth as well but it's very powerful and the, the best thing that has happened so far, well, there's several things. It went to Rochester. The Mayo Clinic sponsored it in, in, in Rochester. 350 people came to the opening. It was unbelievable. All these sites are huge successes. Greenway High School had 700 teachers there last week. And then the teachers were there. And then the next day, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, they had kids come through. And they, it was filled from fifth graders to seniors. And I've learned so much from kids. I haven't been around kids for a long time. Kids are resilient. Kids are strong. They are amazingly smart. And we sometimes, as mental health professionals, not myself, are afraid of introducing this stuff to kids because they think if somebody is struggling and they see a piece of art or they go in this exhibit, that they may go out and take their lives. I don't buy I mean, I don't buy that. There's a, there's a chance that could happen, but we have to do everything we can to bring this to the forefront. So, you know, that's... That's kind of my story in a nutshell, and I could go on forever, because I could go on forever. But it's really important that everybody is not afraid, and we break this stigma, and we talk and we listen. When you get out in your car, don't just drive away and forget about what you hear today. You, we all have a responsibility, and uh, that is to talk and listen and make this world a better place. So thank, thank you very much. Bonjour. Um, I'm Dr. Vinio. I've been on the Fond du Lac Reservation for the last 18 years, family practice physician. Uh, actually, I want to, I want, I'm going to pass this around. This is tobacco. Tobacco, um, let me just get this started. So I, I want everybody just to take a little bit of it, okay? You don't have to, and you can take more if you want, but you know, in the spirit world, the amount of something doesn't matter, okay? Just take a little bit of that. But, but Asema, tobacco was given to us by the Creator as a gift and it's a sacrament. And when we abuse it, it turns into a problem with lung cancers and whatnot. But, but you know, to use it this way, um, so what we're gonna do is, I want everybody just to take a little bit of it, to hold it the entire time for this. And then at the end, there's another basket here and we can put it in there. And then I will take that tobacco later 
and I'll burn it. I'll, I'll start a fire later and I'll burn that tobacco. And you know, and that tobacco, like I said, it's a gift from the Creator and it's a sacrament. So when we use it, when we smoke it, when we use it in ceremonies, you know, when we burn it, then that smoke goes up to the Creator where where it can be, those prayers can be answered. So, um, so that's the purpose of that. And um, I'm actually, so I wrote this article thing and I think quite a few people have read it, but I'm gonna read from that and then we're gonna, we're gonna change things a little bit from there. And uh, Jake is Ivy and I, our son, and um, he's got this. He's channeling somebody, and um, and he's just going to play kind of nice, quiet, subdued stuff in the background. Sons of suicides seldom do well. Characteristically, they find lacking a, life lacking a certain zing. They tend to feel more rootless than most, even in a notoriously rootless nature nation. They are squeamishly and curious about the past and numbly certain about the future to this grisly extent. They suspect that they too will kill themselves. Kurt Vonnegut. God bless you, Mr. Rosewater. My father's suicide is never far from my mind. I go outside at night and I look at the stars and I think about him. He committed suicide when I was four years old. Our family fell apart after that. And my mother remarried an alcoholic lumberjack. After my father's death, my mother started drinking hard. My father owned a tavern called, of all things, the good luck. After his death, my mother tried to keep the business going. She was drinking with my aunt and my uncle, and she left my six-year-old sister in charge. We did what any kids who were living in a bar would do. We started playing with matches. It wasn't long before the entire upstairs of the house was on fire, and we did what any kids in trouble would do. We hid. Someone driving by saw the flames coming out of the upstairs windows and he kicked the door in. He came into the burning house with a rag over his face and he dragged us one by one out of the inferno. There were no cell phones back in those days in 1963 or 1964. And he drove us down the gravel road to my grandmother's house. I don't know how long it was before my mother came back home. And I can't imagine what it felt like for her to see the smoke in the distance and to get closer and closer and to realize that it was her house on fire. I can't imagine her grief and her guilt when she saw the house completely engulfed in flames. There's a crowd there and I don't know how long it was before she found out that her kids were alive. We didn't have any place to stay and we got separated for a while. My older sister and I stayed with another family and the only thing I remember is that their daughter, who was about my sister's age, slept with her eyes open. We all slept in the attic and my sister and I would wake up and go watch her sleeping with her eyes open. I started drinking when I was 12 or 13 years old and I was one of those drunks who cried all the time. Even when I was four years old, I blamed myself for my father's death. And I never knew exactly what it was that I did wrong and no one wanted to talk to me about it. I crashed my first car when I was drunk and 14 years old. I spent the entire summer of my 17th year driving fast and drunk and suicidal. What I wanted more than anything was to be a hero in the high school and to have the high school annual dedicated to me. There were other kids over the years who died in car accidents and almost all of them were drunk and driving fast. The entire community would come out and remember them as gifted and promising with bright futures ahead of them. We would speak of them in hushed tones and we'd go almost reverently to the places where they died and we would walk and measure how far their skid marks were and look at the trees flattened by their cars. We didn't think about death in the way I think about it now and we didn't relate their deaths to our own eventual deaths. I, come from, I didn't come from a family where people had dreams for their futures. I never thought about being a doctor and college was never an option. My family history has always been to go on to lives of chemical dependency and quiet desperation. My Aunt Harriet drank herself to death when she was 27 years old. My Uncle Roger used to come and visit us 
He was always fun. He was always laughing. He drove fast cars and he drank with the adults in my family. He promised me when I turned 16 years old that he would give me whatever car he was driving at the time. On my 16th birthday, I waited for him all day long. And I stood staring out the window in the darkness. He died in some sort of an accident in a recycling plant in Montana when he was still young. All the while, when I was growing up, whenever I drank, I would think about my dad. I always imagined us doing things together and I envisioned him guiding me out of the tragedies I got myself into. I would call his name into the night in my drunkenness and my grief and wait for an answer that never came. I asked one of my elders a long time ago if there was a ceremony that we could do for my father. My father wasn't Ojibwe, he was Finnish. And I was told there was no ceremony for him. And I was told that eventually, when it was my time to go join my ancestors, Ojibwe funerals, it's a four day, it's a four day um, journey. And at the funeral, the person that's doing the funeral tells you what your journey is. You have to go through all these things and there's spirits along the way that you have to give gifts to and you have to get past. And I was told that there were spirits on the side of that path that would try to pull me away from there so I couldn't make it to be with the people that I had lost. And I was told my father would be one of those spirits. None of us are comfortable talking about suicide. I didn't really know what I was going to say when I came here. And I put a call out on Facebook. And then I put a call out on um, some articles, news from Indian country and, and Indians.com. And I started getting names. John, can you hold these for me? So we'll start with there's a page one or something. Let's go by one. So these these names started to come to me. And on Facebook it was just names, but when they came as emails, they were stories. There are families in here. There's a family from an Apache family. There's four names in that family here. And other families that there's another one that there's four names. You know, and people that told me. My husband and I lost our 18-year-old son. We don't live for tomorrow. We don't live for today. We live for yesterday. So I'm just going to read these names. And these are names that are all sent to me. Dale Karasti. Melvin Johnson. Choctaw, age 14. Donald Jasorka. Nathaniel King. Brian David Carson, Gunder Faso, Paul Nissenen, Tom Borsma, Sean Sarazin, Kathy Mackey, Alex Glidden, Randy Hall, Rebecca Scraba, Ross Audio, Joseph Francis Kirch, Luis Beltran, Daryl Brissett, Jack Robinson, David Munster, Sandy Mirick, Katie Hancock, Tyne Mac Hallinan, Ricky House, Americo Martinez, Terry Parsons, Michael Anderson, Nathan Dumkey, Kaylee Mackey, John, Spencer Rock, Nate Forneris, Aaron Tonder, Gordon Tumala, Stephen Block, Dr. Donald Thompson, Marvin Hansen, Darlene Brown, Bruce Madison, Mark LePage, Eddie Hemango, Charles Sackerman, Jack Tranholt, Pat, James Rickman, Daniel Edwards, Michael Webb, Odessa Blanche Martin, this is one of the first of four in a family, John Smith, Lashana Lewis, Michael Wathogama, Frederick Zimmerman, Stephen Arlen Azul, 
Juanita Carpenter, Valeen Kennedy, James Arnold Jimbo Wilson III, Stephen J. Potter, Michael Joseph Bailey, Daisy Mackey, Kendall Murdoch, Wayne Slocum, Johanna Enos, James Giles Hillebrand, Damon James Ward, Dan Knowlton, Elizabeth Marshman, Betsy Potter, Richard Potter, Joseph Strutt, Ronald James Omdahl Sr., Uncle Duane, Roxy McCann, Daniel Guy, Ethan Michelson, Baptiste Provincial, Travis Smith, Trevor Smith Brothers, Perry Custance, Danny Pete, Edmund Farrell, Nihalo Pelaya, Wilfred Pauna, James Poto, John Fistler, Louis Blanche, Drew Acebun Lapointe, Troy Lavoie, Diane Hoff, James Doffelmeyer, Doug Demarest, Jesse James Gardapee, Grant Commonen, Jerry Campbell, Shannon Billich, Daniel A. Hempfield, Larry Tammy, Mark Hansen, Lula Bell Hakes, Boyd Hakes, brother sister, Brittany Ann Carruth, Eugene Phillips, Curtis Matrios, Dale Andrew Brecky, Josephine Rattler, John Fistler, Robert Lucas, Megan Bauer, Dan David Crozier, Michael Boris Shvetsa, Arnie Vineo Sr. Do you have that tobacco? Somebody have that? Oh. This drum was given to me by Herbert Sam and uh, He's one of our elders and, and his family took me in and they taught me some songs. And um, when people are singing happy birthday, I'm the guy that's in the back lip syncing because I can't sing. And we've been told that when you listen to the birds, that not only the ones that sing best sing, they all sing. And Herb gave me this drum. He had this drum made for me. He just didn't give it to me. He had it made for me. And he meant for this to be a healing drum. It's a big responsibility, you know? And I don't know all the songs. I can't really keep the rhythm all the time. And I forget some of the stuff. And there's other people that sing better than I do. But this is my time. And if he meant for this drum, drum to heal, and that's what it's going to do. And the song is an old, old Ojibwe song. It's called Heartbreak. And it was lost for a long time and it came back. It's an old Mille Lacs song. And um, I give these little pocket tools. And these are really good pocket tools. It's a Leatherman Micra. I'm a tool guy. And um, I give these to people that I really like and respect. And I want them, when they carry this, you know, not to think about me. I want them to think about respect and what that means. And this is for John Bauer. Thank you. And so this song, you don't have to remember it. I just want to put it into all of us and it'll be in our hearts. And it'll be in those who lost, that we've lost.
Doesn't have to do it right now, but whenever you're done holding that that tobacco, that same one, you can just put it um, you can put it back in here, and I'll take that and I'll burn it. And so there's there's other in here, and that's that was promised for the people that sent me stories, and you know that I would put tobacco in for them and their families, and and that's what this is. So just we can just go ahead and put it back in here and and hold it as long as you want. And you you don't even have to do that. You can keep it. You can put it outside you know in a clean place if you want to do that but you know but if you want me to burn it and I'll burn it together and it'll be it'll be all of this and all the people from the names that I got from they're from everywhere and um, and all that will be included which thank you that was amazing so I think that's I think we're done you're gonna say something? Oh, no. I think we're done, but enjoy the art, take your time. And if it's not the right time, maybe you need to come back and look at the art, but it's the kind of stuff that needs to be looked at and read and touched. So thank you, it's an amazing night. Thank you very much.